All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, both in Zoom and in real life. Hey, everybody at the center. Hi. Everybody in Zoom land. Hi. <laughs> um, all right. And so uh, tonight's theme for tonight's Dharma talk is going to be something called Samapati, which is normally translated as attainment or plural attainments. This idea of spiritual attainments, but there are specific kind of ideas about this within the world of Buddhism. Uh, specifically, there are traditionally four samapati for attainments. And I am going to tell you about the four attainments. Tonight's going to be an interesting night. As everybody knows, we've been reading through a Mahayana Buddhist sutra that's been describing the Bodhisattva path. And I want to read tonight's section. It's a, actually a much smaller section than we're used to, actually. So the actual reading is going to be pretty short. Um, but in order to really, I think, appreciate it, there's kind of one idea. Uh, again, I've chosen it for the theme for tonight. And this idea doesn't exactly occur in our reading tonight. But I think there's a really uh, a strong case to be made that it's talking about this idea of attainments, but in a particular way. So before we look at the sutra to see how they're talking about this, let me just give you a quick background on the idea of attainments or samapati um, as it's kind of understood generally within the world of Buddhism. Um, and then that'll kind of get us in the right frame of mind to read the sutra. So, um, uh, yeah, and as usual, I'm not going to presume anybody kind of knows anything about this, because I know it's kind of a diverse group here of people who are kind of really, really knowledgeable about all of this, and maybe some folks that have never heard any of this. So, specifically within the world of Buddhism, when we talk about samapati, we're specifically talking about certain meditative states of mind. Let's just put it that way. These are traditionally understood to be, well, traditionally, again, they are four in number, but it's these specific kind of meditative states, if you will. And specifically, samapati, the idea of making an attainment, which I want to talk about that idea of an attainment, but the basic idea of these attainments, these samapati, these are four states of what is called samadhi. So samapati and samadhi are often sometimes synonymous. It's actually the same idea. So these are four samadhis. <laughs> Another word you may or may not be familiar with. So Really quickly, let me just kind of, and this will be one of those nights where I'm actually going to go pretty deep on these various meditative states, kind of describing their differences. So you might have heard a lot of this before from me, but again, this is just to really set up the sutra in a nice way. But Buddhist meditation in general, and, you know, as usual, as always with the Dharma doors, I speak very generally about Buddhism. I try to speak in a way that's really inclusive of all Buddhist traditions in that way. So I just kind of want to be aware that I'm speaking very generally about this, and there are different schools of thought. But in general, Buddhist meditation for me, as, I, as far as I understand it, it's sort of kind of understood as a process that it uses a specific technique. And that technique is called either sati in the Pali language or smrti in the Sanskrit language. The, that word, which is pronounced those two different ways, sati or smrti, it's translated into English as mindfulness. And that's fine. We can stick with that as the translation. 
But I just want you to kind of be aware that the technique, the way to, to do this is through kind of a focused attention. This could be on an object. More traditionally though, it's the object is one's own breathing. So making the breathing, the anapana, the in and out, making that the focus of your attention. And the idea here is, again, I'm kind of just giving you the really uh, basic introduction here in case you're not familiar with it. But the basic idea is, is that our minds are rather frayed, if you will, sort of all over the place kind of bouncing from one idea to the next, bouncing from one sensory object to the next, and sort of just wandering all around. And sometimes this, sometimes this wandering can get really you know, chaotic. And so rather than wandering all around, <laughs> we focus. Again, maybe on the breathing, maybe on a candle flame, maybe on an image. But the idea is, is that you want to be able to comfortably attend to something. And you get better at that. The idea is, is that we are sort of used to bouncing all over the place and we need to train the mind to stay still, to focus. And in that way, one then calms down. And that calming down is shamatha. But this calming or shamatha or samatha, the idea is, is that it comes about by this focused awareness, by this sati or shmurti, this mindfulness. And then the idea is, is that if you can really kind of stay present, stay focused on that object, whether it's your breathing, whether it's an image or what have you, but by anchoring anchoring the mind, eventually one can then slip into or move into what is called a jhana in Pali or a dhyana in Sanskrit. Same word, different pronunciation. But the idea is, is that this is what would be called a meditative absorption. And this is where one is feeling really, really present to whatever one is attending to, basically to the point where a lot, if not all of the superfluousness of life has sort of faded away, by which I mean ideas about tomorrow or later on, ideas about earlier or yesterday or before, and kind of moving deeper and deeper into a present moment. And again, what we're doing is attending to this, either the breathing or the object. And then these dionic states are traditionally numbered as four dionic states. And they are traditionally described by their quality, by which I mean the first dhyana or the first dionic state is usually described as quite joyful, quite pleasant, for some rapturous bliss. <laughs> I find that it varies sort of person to person in that way, but it is a big character or quality, I sh should say. It's a good quality of the first jhana that it's extremely pleasant in that way, in, in the sense that you would really rather not be doing anything else. <laughs> Nothing could be sweeter than that, than this. That's the idea of the first jhana. And in general, there's a sense in which a jhana is a very sort of kind of neutral state. And by neutral, I just want you to know this going into this tonight, traditionally, and again, this is just traditionally, a geonic state is actually one in which one has transcended, in a sense, the realm of desire, 
the realm, the kamadatu as it's called, but the realm of craving and wanting and needing in that sense. And when one is in a jhana or a dhyanic state, it's traditionally though that a jhanic state is being in the realm of pure form. And the realm of pure form traditionally, again, is when you're kind of looking at everything, including your own body, and looking at it all simply in terms of the four great elements. That's what form is. The combinations of earth, water, fire, and air or wind. But I always like to remind all of my students that those four elements are about solidity or density, liquidity or fluidity, temperature, and movement. And everything that we see, everything that we perceive in that way is being understood via its elemental construct, by which I mean its particular density, liquidity, temperature, and heat, or sorry, temperature and movement. So when one is viewing the world just in terms of how dense it is, just in terms of how fluid it is, just in terms of the temperature, and just in terms of whether it's moving or not, there's kind of not a lot to get worked up about in that realm. <laughs> because something being more dense or less dense is not really a cause for concern. It's just, they're just different densities, different temperatures. One temperature isn't better than another, it's just a different temperature. And so the idea is, one second, Tanya, let me just finish this thought. So the idea is, is that within that realm of pure form, that is traditionally a geonic state, it's rather equanimous in that way because everything is so mm, simple in that way. And the joy, the, the sukha, as it's called, the kind of the bliss that comes from being in a geonic state, as I understand it, it comes from the feeling of relief of not being in the kamadatu, in the realm of desire. This tremendous sense of liberation from the wanting, the craving, the desiring, and being in this rather neutral state of the four elements. But what I want to kind of remind you of is that from a Buddhist point of view, this realm of pure form, it's kind of, kind of, it's kind of what's going on out there and with this anyways, but we are heaping on top of the realm of pure form, meaning and significance and aesthetic beauty and desirability and all of this stuff that's being heaped on top of the realm of pure form. And so the idea is, is that when we liberate ourselves from all of that projection and all of that, and we are actually confronted with this realm of pure form, it's traditionally understood as quite liberating. Again, so liberating that the first stage of it is sukha, blissful. All right, Tanya, what you got? So I was just thinking, um, about the realm of form and then the sense gates, right? You know, the senses. And so I, I guess I always myopically kind of, or maybe myopically think I thought about it visually, but it really, it's also applicable to like, you know, everything, right? Sound, hearing, touch. And you could like look at that, those different sensations through the four elements. Excellent, perfect, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, there's a, yes, there's a way yeah, and I don't want to go too deep into that because I'd spend there too long. But absolutely, when we talk about the realm of form, especially me, I tend to gravitate towards the visual 
But yes, this is about the auditory and the meaning that we're heaping on top of sounds, the meaning that we're heaping on top of smells, flavors, tactility, and so on. Got it. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so really quickly again, and this is all <laughs> preparatory to get us to the idea of samadhi, so then, then we can read this cool sutra. But really quickly again, the idea is, is that from this jhanic state, the initial jhanic state, there's three more stages. And without going into great detail, and this is actually one area where a lot of different schools or at least different teachers vary in how they describe it. So I just want to say that the general idea is that as you move into what is called the second jhana or the second dhyanic state, and then the third jhana, what happens between those is that the joy, the rapture, and the bliss subsides. There's not as much ecstasy or that kind of rapture in a sense because the contrast between the realm of desire and the realm of form, when you first move out of the realm of desire to the realm of form, the contrast is very sharp. And so the feeling is very blissful or again, ecstatic. But as one abides in that state, that, that kind of, woo, you know, the joy sort of subsides to varying degrees of contentment, as it were. Not so rapture, but more tranquil, more still in that way. And this process then kind of culminates in entry into the fourth jhana, which is marked by or characterized by upeksha, equanimity. And I was already describing equanimity in terms of the realm of form, but the idea is, is that that process of being in the realm of form gets more and more still and more and more still until there is this total upeksha, equanimity. And again, this will de depend upon the school, depend upon the teacher, but the basic idea is that there is an absolute equanimity basically between pleasure and pain. That is normally how it's defined, as that those two are no longer registering. So that's the a kind of a, a working definition of upeksha here is neither joyful, rapturous, or blissful, and neither sad and suffering or whatever, but just upekshik in that way. Okay. Now, all of that, of course, that process that I just described, beginning with our mindful focus, our sati, entering into a, a jhana going deeper into that state and then getting to upeksha, all of that is traditionally a prerequisite in order to enter into what is called a samadhi. So a samadhi is norm, or the, the word samadhi is normally translated as concentration. Mm, and that's an okay but, you know, it's a normal traditional translation, so that's okay. The word samadhi, the, the root of that word is actually dar in Sanskrit, dar, which means to hold. And samada, samada is to hold together. That's literally kind of what the word sama D or samada means to hold together. And because this isn't really what I'm here to talk about tonight, I want to say it really simply. A basic defining quality of a samadhi is normally the dissolution of the sense of self. In, in, in essence, the way that I would describe it is let's say, and this, it gets tricky to describe if, if I use the example of breathing, 
you it's this is done using breathing but it in order for me to describe it for some reason it gets complicated when when you're meditating on your own breathing so i will i'm going to use the the classic example of like a candle flame but hope bear with me on my example let's say you were going to do this meditative process that i've just been describing and you were using a candle flame well candle flame is a great anchor for attention, right? It's so dazzling, right? It's so interesting. So it's easy to actually kind of uh, attend to a little tea candle flame. Great. So that's our anchor. And we're going to use that to do sati. And as I'm concentrating on my little candle flame, my mind might wander, but then I know, ah, bring it back. And if I can hone it in and stay attending to the candle flame, I would enter into that realm of pure form. And that would be this realm in which I'm not seeing a little tea candle I bought at Ikea or whatever it is. It would actually be attending to the fire element itself. And a candle flame is like pure, like there's no liquid. I mean, you know, there's, in the flame, I mean, there's no liquid, there's no density in that way. There's movement because <laughs> it's fed by air and there's fire. So you can get really elemental with a candle flame and use that elemental fire to move through those dionic states I was just describing to that point of upeksha. And then what a samadhi would be is when the line between me and the thing I'm attending to blurs or disappears. And there's a, a kind of a melding or emerging experience. And again, this is taught differently, described differently by different teachers and different schools. But the general sense that a samadhi is a state of union, a state of oneness, a state of that holding together as one, samada, samadhi. That is the kind of general sense of a samadhi. And now I can tell you that if you were able to do that, if you were able to experience that meditative dissolution of the self, merger with kind of everything in that way, that's traditionally called an attainment. That's the samapati. Now, there's four stages of samadhi. Like there were the four stages of dhyana, there's a four stages of samadhi, and each of those is considered an attainment. And in, in order to walk us through this, I'm going to show you something. This is going to be you know, very much to Tanya's uh, comment about the auditory. I'm going to be using a visual example, but rest assured, this is going on for all of the sensory organs as well. It's just that given this medium we're in, the visual will suffice. So in order to kind of get at where we're going later on tonight, I want to use one of my classic examples to, you know, define a few terms, describe a few ideas, and, and basically to describe these four states of samadhi, as I understand them. So what I want to share with you is, and this is a, a, an example I use a lot, and I'm going to be using it to kind of get us to, uh, as a way of getting us to look at our own minds as a way to get us to look at how our own minds are working and then what samadhi would mean to you in that way. So here's my example. Again, everybody's seen it, but I feel like maybe there's a few people here that haven't. And the example goes like this. By the way, and by the way, we're taking a pause from the meditation for a moment to establish a few ideas. And the scenario that I want to set up for you, it looks a little something like this. The idea is, is that you can imagine, ooh, there's a knock at the door. Who could it be? So what I want to pretend, as usual, is that there's two people here. 
like me and a friend. And we hear a knock at the door. And so we both go over to the little peephole in the door and we look through and we see this this time. Now, the idea here is, is that through our little peephole, these two people, let's say I looked through the peephole and I go and I go, ooh, that's fun. Somebody brought champagne. <laughs> There's a, it's a, it's a wine glass, right? It's like a goblet. Mm. So I'm all excited because somebody's bringing over champagne. And I see it in the, in, the, in the little people. And my other friend says, oh, really? Let me see. And they go over and they look and they see two people. And they move back away from the door and they're a little nervous. I'm like, why are you nervous? It's, it's a champagne. And the person says, champagne, what are you talking about? It's two people. And, you know, I'm a little uh, socially, I have a little social anxiety. And so the idea of people coming over makes me a little nervous. So now we have two different people who perceived, who perceived two different things going on at the door. And because they perceived two different things, they both of them had different vedana, different sensory reactions. One was nervous about this situation, and the other was excited about this situation. Okay, so that's the idea here. And what I want to talk about is a few different things. So the idea here is, is that there is a perception game going on here. And in fact, we're doing it all the time. You're perceiving me, hi, and you're distinguishing, say, me from my screen back here. And you're doing all kinds of discerning and distinguishing in that way. So it's a rather normal to go on. What I want to show you with this example is something very interesting about the way the mind works. And that's about how in order to perceive something like, and by perceive, <clears throat> excuse me, by perceive here, what I mean is <clears throat> like discern, distinguish something as being like, oh, look, a bird. Look, oh, it's a bird. <laughs> oh, look, it's a, it's a, what do you got? Right? What, you know, which kind of person are you in that way? Well, regardless of whether you're the type of person that sees the glass or sees the two people, what I want you to kind of notice about perception is that in order to perceive the, the glass, the goblet here, it requires what we could call in that, in this situation, it requires space. So this is a term called akasha. And so in, if I'm perceiving this as a glass, in order to perceive the form of a glass, it requires the space around the glass in order for there to be a glass, because I want you to think about what if there wasn't this space on either side? You, you, you wouldn't have this particular form that you're seeing as a glass. But then what I want you to notice is that if you're the kind of person that saw two faces, this space, the space in between them, your perception is relying upon space in order to perceive form. So there is an intimate relationship between form and the space that allows you to perceive form. Because if these two hands occupied the same space, they would be the same hand. So it is because there is space 
that you can conceive of and perceive two hands, or it is because of space that you can perceive 10 fingers. You're using this space to perceive fingers in order for there to be 10. So the realm of perceiving, the realm of perception is sort of, <clears throat> again, it's kind of relying on this dimension of space. But what I want you to notice is, is that as soon as I mention the palms of my hands, Even though there's no actual space between the palm of my hand and the fingers and all the rest, your mind can perceive the palm of my hand because it can, I don't want to say that it creates space. It is not that the mind creates space, but it, the mind needs space in order to perceive in that way. Everybody follow me on this idea of perception and space? Excellent. Because the thing about this one that I want you to notice is that if you're seeing the glass, this is space and this is space. But if you're seeing the faces, then this is space. So ergo, this is all space, right? If, one, if you understood what I just said at a perceptive level about how form is space in that way, then you just had a little glimpse into the realm of infinite space. Infinite space is a dimension of reality that is right here. It's everywhere. But because you're perceiving and discerning and delineating things, you are sort of like kind of seeing space as a shadow of form. But as I just described, you could meditate on this and slip right into the realm of infinite space <clears throat> where you are not discerning faces or a glass. But what's really interesting about perceiving this as space is this whole black white problem. But if you can see them both as space, that's where the realm of infinite space is in that way. It's kind of right in between everything, so to speak. And so, by doing the practice that I just described that begins with sati, the mindfulness, attending to it to go into the realm of pure form, and then through these various stages of form, then one can then pass right into the realm of infinite space. But that is the process that one would do, need to use to do that in that way, because one is calming the mind down of that projecting habit. First projecting desirability, and then even projecting form. So now the first attainment, the first samapati, is when you make it to the realm of infinite space, which by the way, is the first realm of the formless realm. This is the Arupa Datu, the formless realm. And there are four varying levels to the realm of formlessness. It begins with this realm of infinite space because space has no form. It has no shape, no size, no color. It's utterly not physical in that way. Everybody doing okay? Coolio. So now, if we wanted to make our second attainment and enter into the realm of infinite consciousness, that's the second samadhi, and that would be our second attainment. If we wanted to make it there, we would need to know kind of something. 
And the way that I want to describe it is, is this. Remember our perceiving mind? Remember our perceiving mind that was perceiving two people or perceiving a glass? Remember that mind? <laughs> so let's think of that mind as this hand, just for convenience sake. And then this is our object of meditation. So our mind is kind of meditating on our little candle flame. So mind attending to candle flame. Candle flame goes from being beautiful in the realm of desire to being just the fire element in the realm of form. And then when, when we move into infinite space, there's no more candle flame. There's no more none. And the idea is, is that the mind that was attending to the candle flame, that then was attending to the fire element, that mind is sort of now attending to the realm of infinite space. <laughs> so space has in a way become an object of meditation. And so in order to get to the second samadhi, we, we move away that very idea of even space. And now there is just the conscious mind, but not conscious of anything. <clears throat> that's the realm of infinite consciousness. And the way that this is described, by the way, just so that you have the kind of a, a proper feeling for it, the mind, as I described at the beginning, is all over the place. And so when you begin to remove the desire realm, the realm of desire, the mind calms down. And then when you move into just the realm of pure form, the mind is very calm. And then when you take, get into the realm of space, it's like super, super calm. And then when you remove even that very idea of space, what they say is, is that there's kind of a residual hum of consciousness. And it's just this kind of echo of consciousness. It's not conscious of anything, but there is a sense of awareness, if you will. But that sense of awareness is just this residual hum. And then that hum, that residual hum, if one abides sort of long enough in that realm of consciousness, the hum subsides. And then one enters the realm of infinite nothingness, the akimkanya ayatana, the base of infinite nothingness. And this is the state that I often describe to people just to give them a sense of it. This is kind of like being blacked out, where you have no cognizant, there's no cognition going on. In terms of meditation, what this often feels like, from my experience, is where you, you hit the meditation timer, and then all of a sudden the meditation bell goes off, and you're like, it cannot have been 30 minutes already. <laughs> and sure enough, 30 minutes have passed, but there was just absolute stillness with no cognition at all. That's the general description of the state of infinite nothingness the third samapati. If one then can abide well enough, long enough, what have you enough, in that third samadhi, that third state of just infinite still stillness, infinite nothingness, one then attains the fourth samapati, the fourth samadhi, which is called the state of neither perception nor non-perception. <clears throat> Naiva samya ni samya ayatanya. Now, that, of course, is somewhere I've never really been. So this is all very intellectual as far as the way, to, uh, the way I have come to understand it. 
but it has a lot to do with this word samnya. Samnya is, of course, the word that I've been calling perception, perceiving. <clears throat> perceiving anything, that form of perception, is a form of dis discernment, discrimination. And so this fourth samapati, this fourth attainment, is one in which there is neither perceiving nor not perceiving. neither perceiving nor not perceiving. This is understood to be, of course, beyond the state of nothingness. And again, the descriptions of this will vary teacher to teacher, school to school, but this is sort of an exalted state where, this is how I've come to understand it intellectually. But again, this uh, is not from personal experience in that way. It's just from reading sutra after sutra after sutra in that way. But my sense is, is that what they're talking about with this fourth samadhi is a state in which perception is not taking place from the vantage point of the ego manas self mind. So it's not perception, but it's not blacked out, not cognizant. So it's neither perceiving nor not perceiving. And that seems to be a state that is beyond sort of, well, beyond perception by definition. And we're going to go deeper in this tonight, by the way. I'm, this has all been preparatory for the reading. So everybody feeling okay about those four samapattis? Again, the fourth one, I, I don't know in that way. Um, so here you go. What I want you to know is, is this. The sutra that we've been reading, the sutra that I'm about to get to, is one of those Mahayana Buddha sutras that's describing the Bodhisattva path. And when it comes to Samadhi, and when it comes to Samapati, the Bodhisattva path is very different than what could be called the Hinayana or the Theravada or the kind of early style of Buddhism. And what I mean is, in the early style of Buddhism, these four samapati, these four attainments, they were these spiritual attainments. And the idea is, is that you would go to your teacher and say, oh, you know, I was meditating and it got really calm and really blissful. And then all of a sudden, I just felt like there was this dissolution of self, and it just felt like it was infinite space or something. It was crazy. <laughs> Your teacher would say, ah, you attained the first samadhi. And then that student could claim to have attained to the first samadhi. Like they now can almost in a way wear it as a little merit badge. Like, ah, little merit badge, I made it to the first samadhi. Where'd you make it? You make it to the second samadhi? And so the idea is, is that in the kind of earlier tradition, samadhi was basically exclusively, and again, I'm generalizing, but samadhis were kind of exclusively legs crossed, eyes closed, under a tree, in a forest, in a cave, deep, deep meditative state. Like, again, full lotus, eyes closed, out, and sitting there, sometimes for hours or days to achieve these samadhis, all right? The bodhisattva path is a little different. It's a little different, again, in terms of samadhi. It's a little different in terms of samapati or these attainments. And in particular, it's very different regarding the higher samadhis, in particular, the fourth one that I want to talk about. So before things get too late, let me read the little section. Last week, if you were here or, um, or even if you weren't, let me remind you. Last week, as part of this teaching on the Bodhisattva path, we were introduced to the six paramitas, otherwise 
uh, kind of called the six perfections, the six um, transcendences, different ways to translate paramita. But we talked about these six practices of the bodhisattva, this quality of generosity or giving, this quality of dana, this quality of shila, moral discipline, observing precepts, the quality of kashanti, peacefulness or patience, the virya, drive or determination, dhyana, we just got talking about dhyana. So dhyana is a quality or a practice of the bodhisattva, that still mindful meditation. And then the sixth was pranya, wisdom, a specific kind of wisdom, of course, this kind of transcendent wisdom. So those were the six paramitas. Those were introduced last week. I just want to remind you also the way that the sutra has been going, the one that we've been reading. Many, 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 many weeks ago, the Buddha first told us about the one quality that a bodhisattva should have. And then after that, in the next part, the Buddha told us two qualities the bodhisattva should have. And then three qualities, and then four, then five. And then last week it was six. And those were the paramitas. Those were the six qualities or practices of a bodhisattva. Tonight, we're going to learn about the seven qualities or practices of the bodhisattva. And I want to tell you right away, the first six of these are the paramitas again. So we're getting, we're going to get a kind of a review, but this, this section tonight is going to go much deeper into the six paramitas. And then of course, it's going to add a seventh practice. So um, as usual, and I think Tanya put the link in there, right? Um, so as usual, I'm reading from an English translation from the Tibetan, but I also have the Chinese that I'm working or did a, I did a English translation from the Chinese. There isn't an English translation already from the Chinese. So I'm gonna kind of toggle a little bit back and forth between the English translation from the Tibetan and my own translation from Chinese. But here's the first practice or quality. So <clears throat> the Buddha tells Shariputra, Shariputra is the monk who's receiving these teachings. He says, additionally, Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have seven qualities, then their aspiration for enlightenment will not degenerate and their Buddha realms will become pure. What are the seven? They are giving away all of one's possessions without apprehending such generosity. Um, <clears throat> the the Chinese one, which I'll just share with you the way that I would translate the Chinese, it's about that dana or giving, gi giving everything away. That part is the same. It says giving everything away. The Bodhisattva gives everything away because they know there's nothing to attain is actually what it says. And that's a very kind of special specific mention of these samapatis in that sense of attainment in that way. And that is where we're going tonight with this kind of very subtle form of the bodhisattva practice. So basically, as we go through these, and again, let's start with the first one, which is this generosity. Traditionally, the way that this is worded regarding the bodhisattva path they would traditionally say that a bodhisattva practices generosity, practices being generous, practices giving without the notion of gift, giver, or recipient. That's how the bodhisattva practices dana. And the idea here, of course, is what they're kind of referring to or 
one way to understand what they're referring to is in the traditional culture of India, in the traditional culture of Buddhism, if I give you something, I get punya, I get merit. It's like, it's, it's like, it's good for my karmic load to give in that way. And so in traditional Indian culture, in traditional Buddhist culture, if you practice giving, you get punya, you get merit. And if you build up enough merit, whew, you could get a better rebirth, you could get reborn in a heavenly realm, and you could actually even kind of transfer or use that punya to get enlightened. So boy, you better, you know, build up your punya load. So here's the thing about it. The idea of giving is a good thing. It's better than hoarding. It's better than selfishly, you know, hiding away things in that way. So there's giving. And so in the early Buddhist tradition, when they celebrated giving, when they said, yeah, everybody, you should be generous. It's awesome. That is, that's true. It is awesome. Everybody should be generous. But what I want you to notice is, is that the Bodhisattva is in the business of practicing giving and also simultaneously in the business of, in a way, transcending the notion of giving transcending the very transactionality of all of this. That's truly like next level giving, where you can be so generous. And not only that, you're not thinking of it as being generous. You're not thinking of it as giving anything to anybody in that way. That's the first quality of a bodhisattva. Giving away everything because they know that there is nothing to attain. There's no punya to attain. There's no buddy to attain any punya. So let's go. <laughs> All right, that's number one. Everybody feeling good about that? Cool. Number two, number two is Shariputra. The Bodhisattva has flawless discipline, flawless morality, flawless shila without having the concept of Shila, <laughs> without having the concept of moral discipline. Um, yeah, and the, the Chinese is basically the same, but it, they put it in terms of that the Bodhisattva doesn't break precepts, but without any notion of precepts in that way. So, Again, a very, very kind of similar idea that in the early tradition, of course, of course, we were being nonviolent, truth speakers, not stealing, being careful with our sexuality, avoiding intoxicants. So we were doing these things in the early Buddhist path, but with this notion of moral discipline, with this notion of there's good action, there's bad action, and I'm going to cultivate the good action. And if I cultivate enough good action in that way, enough moral discipline, nirvana, enlightenment, but that's the idea. Awesome. Yes, everybody should be morally disciplined. It's to everybody's benefit to do so. The idea is, though, again, the bodhisattva, definitely not breaking precepts, definitely morally disciplined. But what's wild about the Bodhisattva is they do it without the notion of moral discipline. Now, I, what I want you to kind of be thinking about it about is this isn't, of course, this kind of like not knowing the difference between right and wrong and things like that. It's not like that. It's not like, because again, the Bodhisattva adheres to moral discipline. They just do it without that idea that this is being morally disciplined in that sense. <clears throat> okay, now 
there uh, because of time i'm going to kind of move through these because i want to definitely get to the latter ones which are very interesting but at any point anybody stop me do you have questions or comments well cool. so the third the bodhisattva is patient and gentle so those are the qualities of kashanti patience and gentleness so the bodhisattva is patient and gentle without observing that state of mind. And the Chinese here, um, they are patient and gentle. Ah, the, the Chinese here was a little different. Yeah, the Chinese here was a little different. And I think this one is actually um, more interesting. So the Chinese, it says that the Bodhisattva is patient and gentle because sentient beings are unable to be attained. So that's some weird language there. Um, of course, we've talked, we talk about this a lot in the Dharma doors, but of course, and I know this is a little late to drop this on you, but the Bodhisattva path, of course, is sort of philosophically grounded in this teaching of emptiness, as it's called, shunyata, this sort of emptiness of all phenomena, emptiness of all dharmas. And one of the trickier ones, one of the trickier dharmas to grok the emptiness of is the emptiness of sentient beings. It's in fact, you know, I'm always, always quoting from the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. And, you know, the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra is very, very famous for the Buddha saying this very interesting thing. And I won't go too into it. I'll just kind of leave it to, as a koan in a sense. But what the Buddha says in that sutra is, imagine all the kinds of sentient beings, whether they're born from a womb or out of an egg, out of moisture, miraculous transformation. And I cause them all to enter nirvana, the final nirvana without remainder, and thus liberating all sentient beings. In reality, he says, not a single sentient being would be liberated. And that's the essential teaching of the sutra is there's no such thing as sentient beings in that way. <laughs> and what I kind of want to start bringing us back to is, if I can find it, these sentient beings. So what I want you to kind of think about or is don't think of this as an optical illusion or as like a piece of paper or whatever. Like I'm really want you to kind of imagine a scenario where two people look through a peephole and see two entirely different things. And one of those people is seeing what they think are people. <laughs> and they're seeing what they think are people because they have noses, because they have foreheads, because they have chins, you know, they have the characteristics of a person. <laughs> so the idea here is, is that the other person who's seeing the characteristics of a, of a glass, they're not seeing these people the other person's talking about. Well, and that's because the people are empty in that sense. They are a perception of the perceiving mind. And so in the same way that you might think I have a nose, <laughs> a chin, and a forehead, and because I have those characteristics and many more, you might think I'm a sentient being, humanoid creature in that way. <laughs> Interestingly, the bodhisattva is very on top of the perception game very on top of how it is that all of this perception is happening. 
in particular, very aware of how all of this perception is arising out of infinite space, being ordered into form, and then heaped with meaning and significance. And so the Bodhisattva at that point has a profound understanding of anatta or anatman, no self, no essence, no soul. In fact, the no essence, no self, no soul of all sentient beings. And so when the Chinese version says that the Bodhisattva is patient and gentle because sentient beings are not to be found. How I wanna teach that or how I would like to teach that tonight, the teaching or the, the paramita, the practice of Kishanti, the third of the paramitas here, peacefulness or patience is particularly about not getting angry. And in particular, it's about not getting angry with other people. So other people might say things that you disagree with. Other people might do things that you disagree with. And those things can make you angry. And the idea of peacefulness or kashanti is that it's a quality of a bodhisattva to basically not get angered in that way, to not get triggered in that sense, to keep it chill in that way. And this has always been a practice. This has always been a quality of a Buddhist in that sense. But again, in terms of the early form of Buddhism, there was a deep understanding or a sense in which there were a lot of disturbed people out there, like with big karmic problems. And so we need to be patient with them. And of course, it is a tremendous practice to be patient and tolerant. But again, this bodhisattva practice is an, at an even higher level because it's not that they're not getting angry because they, out of compassion for this person, it's out of wisdom that they understand that it isn't like that. Meaning these sentient beings and this self and this other it's all being dependently originated in that sense. The very sense of self is arising with that sense of other. And so the Bodhisattva combats that construction of self via othering, combats that by this understanding of the emptiness of sentient beings in that way. Profound practice. There's a, obviously there's a theme here in that way. So, everybody doing okay? The fourth, making good time here. So the fourth, the bodhisattva engages in virya, engages in diligence or determination without observing body, speech, or mind. And let's see. Um, the Chinese is they generate or cultivate virya because the body and mind are unable to be attained. So basically the same idea. So really quickly, the thing about virya, the thing about determination or drive. In original Buddhism, in the early teaching, the idea of virya or this kind of drive you know, and it's going to be the same for the bodhisattva in a way, but this is specifically about putting forth the effort to do that mindful practice I've been talking about all night. <laughs> that requires actually determination, stick to itness, because the mind is going to want to wander. The mind is going to want to satisfy sen senses in that sense. And so showing up, meaning making it to the San Francisco Dharma Collective or making it to your meditation cushion, that's the drive, that's the energy, that's the virya. And the idea is, is that if you, if you say, you know what, I'm going to meditate tomorrow. And then tomorrow you're like, you know what, 
I'm going to meditate tomorrow. Do you really think you'll make any progress if that's the way it's done, which is that you never show up and do it? So energy or virya or determination is, is about that showing up and particularly about that stick to itedness, sticking to the object of your uh, focus or concentration. So that's that kind of idea of uh, drive, determination in that sense. And what I wanted to do was kind of be specific about how virya is about meditation. It's about the body and the mind in that way, controlling the body, controlling the mind. Notice that the bodhisattva here engages in that virya, but without observing any body, any speech or mind. So in the Tibetan, they, they go for the three sources of karma. So the body, speech, and mind. The Chinese was just mind, body. So, but basically the same idea. All of this, of course, should now start to sound very familiar in terms of that the bodhisattva does this diligent practice, but without even a sense of there being a body or a mind that is doing this practice in that sense. Everybody okay? Cool. Because number five, perfecting dhyana, the bodhisattva perfects dhyana or insight, vipassana, kind of similar in that sense here, but they perfect, oh wait, I'm sorry. The bodhisattva accomplishes dhyana, accomplishes meditation in undirected concentration. That's the Tibetan. The Chinese is that they are accomplished in dhyana, accomplished in meditation, because they do not abide in dhyana. So we're getting subtle. So the way that I would describe this, and this is just really quickly the way that I would describe it. So this state of mind that I've been describing all night, beginning with the mindfulness in order to get into a dhyana, in order to get into a samadhi, the way that I've been describing that has been as this, you know, seated, focused concentration practice. And what I want you to think about is the kind of the mentality. I want you to think about kind of the approach to practice, the approach to meditation, where the approach is like this. You know what? All of this no suffering business sounds good to me. So I'm going to do the meditation. I'm going to do the dhyana. And so every Thursday, no, forget that. I'm really committed to this. Every night for an hour, I'm going to do dhyana. Great. What are you doing the other 23 hours of the day? Right. What I'm getting at is, is that there is a way in which you can approach dhyana as there's dhyana, and then there's not dhyana. There's me doing meditation and being a good Buddhist or me being a good practitioner, and then me not doing that. Well, the idea of the bodhisattva here is that they are accomplished in dhyana without that concept of dhyana, by which I would interpret that as being this notion of dhyana as this you know, like amusement park that you go to for a little while and then go home or something like that. While it is like everything else I've been saying tonight, if you could meditate for an hour a night, <sighs> hats off, ha honestly. And I mean that, that that would be, that's awesome. That's good. There's no putting that down. And none of this is intended to belittle or put down what is a beautiful practice, by which I mean the Theravada Hinayana practice. 
it's just that this bodhisattva is involved in something a little bit more different in that way, where this idea of not distinguishing dhyana, and again, this doesn't mean, oh, well, me watching TV is dhyana. It's all dhyana. It's no, 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 no. It's not that kind of a mentality in that way. So just want to be clear that this isn't about just kind of equalizing everything. It's more subtle than that. Okay, just a couple more. The sixth paramita is pranya. So this will have to do with pranya. So perfecting pranya, perfecting insight. That's where they translate it as insight or wisdom, perfecting pranya. Without any concepts, <laughs> it's just no concepts whatsoever. Um, whereas the Chinese says that their pranya, the bodhisattva's pranya wisdom is complete because there is no differentiation. So that, of course, is a big one. When we talk about in the tradition, when we talk about differentiation or distinction, we are of course talking about <laughs> differentiating and distinguishing this from this, or these from this, or me from you, or here from there, all of these differentiations and distinctions. That's not pranya. That's not this transcendent wisdom, which is the, the mind that's distinguishing or discriminating this from that, here from there. Whereas the bodhisattva is cultivating this kind of wisdom that is free of concepts per the, the Tibetan version or free of discriminations or discernments in that way. That Michael. Perfect. Yeah, Brendan. What, what are the two uh, translations? I mean, the first one was ridiculous and the second one was also just only obnoxious. Yeah. So the basic idea here is, is that the Bodhisattva here is, has perfect insight without any concepts. Whereas the Chinese says that the Bodhisattva is uh, that their wisdom is perfect or fulfilled or complete because there is no differentiation. Yep. Is that like the, the hierarchy of kind of understanding, like whatever differentiation you do is there's like fluidity. You're not like, you know, putting a bunch of weight on a particular concept. I mean, let me, I how wish should, I, how should we, I'll tell you a good way to think about it. Um, I won't go grab it, so I'm going to need everybody to use your imagination real quick, all right? So what I was going to go grab to illustrate this is a mirror. So imagine a mirror. What I want you to think about is how if I had a mirror and I were to say, hold it up, in that mirror, and if I were to actually hold it up like to the camera, in that mirror, you would see all the little Zoom windows with all the different people in them. You would see, if I held it up here, you would see my laptop, you would see the room in the surface of the mirror. Now, what I want you to think about in terms of differentiating, and conceiving. What I want you to think about is how you could stare into the surface of a mirror and discern all the different objects you want. You could be like, oh, look, and there's the people at the SF SFDC, and there's those people, and there's those people. Oh, wow. And so you could do that all you want. But if you kind of take a step back, you can observe how this is just the surface of a mirror. And in that sense, 
it is, well, it's kind of monolithic, meaning it's kind of just one image that the mind can, using space, separate into a bunch of different things. But intellectually, you know that the surface of a mirror is sort of all one thing, but it's not even one thing because it's dynamically changing constantly. So what I'm getting at is, is that if you can vibe on that, if you can imagine how it is that you can stare into the surface of a mirror and see all kinds of different things, but then zoom out and realize that it's one reflection, it's one, one. Well, you could also then look around and see all kinds of different things in your and wherever you are. Or you could zoom out a little bit and see everything as if it were the reflection in a mirror. That would be a non-differentiating mind. And by the way, a mind that could do that, that could really observe all phenomena as this kind of deeply inner penetrating web of reflections, that might be akin to or close to that state of neither perception nor non-perception, where there is, per it's not perceiving in terms of, oh, look, look at that, look at that, but it's also not not perceiving because it's perceiving this sort of Again, vastly interconnected, interdependent web of reflections in that way. Yeah, Tanya. So I got two comments. So kind of vibing off what you were saying. So there's two things, right? There was without concepts and with, that was one. And the other one was complete because there is no differentiation. And so that's vibing with what you were just saying. But it also just really strikes me as like non-duality. It's Excellent. just like non-dual. <clears throat> yes. And then, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 please, it, you go. And then the first one, without any concepts, it made me think about how, about, well, prana, and it makes me think about emptiness. And you, emptiness, because it's a concept, is even empty. So like, you have to have no concepts. You have to just like, let go of that. Does that kind of make sense? Totally. I'm, I'm on board with Tanya's comment. <laughs> awesome. But and it's really cool. It's really cool that the, each of the different um, translations kind of pointed to sort of, because they're related, right? To sort of pointed to different thing. well, yep. and you these can things. Well, these things that are related. Kind of triangulated a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. And on your first comment about the... Um, I forget exactly what word you used. Non-dual. Non-dual. That was the word. So what I want to kind of then now try to, I'm going to try to tie this whole Dharma talk together here. We still have one more quality to go, by the way, too. But regarding my first rather long introduction to samadhis, in which there was this dissolution of the self, merger with everything, conceptualization was diminishing until there was this kind of clearing out of such conceptualization. What I want you to notice, this has actually been the point of my whole Dharma talk tonight. I want you to notice how traditionally in the early form of Buddhism, you would do dhyana and samadhi, eyes closed, cross-legged in a cave. The bodhisattva here is doing this dhyana and samadhi while giving presents to people is doing this samadhi while being not violent and while telling the truth is doing this samadhi in life, in life eyes open. But the idea is, is that when you're practicing giving, for example, while not conceiving of gift giver and recipient, you're moving towards that samadhi experience, that uh, the 
getting rid of the line that separates me from you in that way. So I just want to share, that's kind of, again, what I really wanted to do tonight was share how the Bodhisattva practice is in a way no different than the early practice, but is also very different than that because of this, well, it's what Thich Nhat Hanh called socially engaged Buddhism. And it's where we get to samadhi, like with each other in that way. It's this really interesting practice. On that note of this very interesting practice, we got to read our last seventh quality. So again, remember, the first six of these were exactly the six paramitas. So what's this seventh one? Right? It's like, oh, what could this be? So number seven, the Bodhisattva recollects, and I'm going to read this just the way it's written, recollects the Buddha while dispelling all characteristics. Otherwise, the Bodhisattva is mindfully in accord with all Buddhas because they are free from all characteristics. Both the Tibetan and the Chinese are using this term lakshana. That's this idea of a characteristic or a quality. And the idea of being free of all characteristics or qualities in the recollection of the Buddha. So as I often like to tell people, Whenever you see this term in a Buddhist text of recalling the Buddha or recollecting the Buddhas of the past or something like that, the word that's being translated as recollect is the word sati or smrti. The word sati or smrti, again, same word, Pali or Sanskrit, it literally means to remember. To, to, to bring something to mind, to recall something. That's actually sati. The practice of recalling the Buddhas, remembering the Buddhas, is a form of mindfulness. It's a form of sati, but it's not sati on your breathing. It's not sati on a candle flame. It's mindfulness of the Buddha. Now, traditionally, this would be done using a Buddha statue and you, or a Buddha image, like a tanka or something like that. And the idea is, is that you would concentrate on the image of the Buddha and use that as the anchor of your concentration. Also, there is a practice of mindfulness of the Buddha, Buddha Nashmurti, as it's called, there is a practice of the mindfulness of the Buddha that's not about staring at an image of the Buddha. It's actually about bringing to mind, recalling or remembering the 32 lakshana of a Buddha, the 32 auspicious marks of a Buddha. So those 32 auspicious marks those are lakshana, those are characteristics. And an enlightened being is understood to have 32 auspicious characteristics, a protrudence out of the top of their head called an ushnisha, a white tuft of hair in between their eyebrows, webbed fingers and toes, 40 teeth, the list goes on and on. And so what you would do is, is you would kind of meditate on those lakshana in order to generate a visual image of the Buddha and then meditate on that visual image of the Buddha using Lakshana. That's what our sutra means by the Bodhisattva is mindful of the Buddhas without characteristics. But now I, I want to give you an even juicier nugget to think about regarding being mindful of the Buddha without characteristics. So this is going to have to be quick because I know time is short. Speaking of short, 
So really quickly, regarding characteristics, regarding Lakshana, I want to share with you one particular characteristic or quality to think about. And if you think about this one just the right way, you might get a glimpse of the Buddha. And what I mean is, is this. A characteristic that I often like to talk about is the characteristic of being a big guy. Am I a big guy? Like, am I tall? Am I big? What are you trying to say? I'm small? Regular. Now, the idea here is, is that me being tall or big would be a characteristic of Michael. Like you would think Michael might be a tall person. And of course, what I want you to be thinking about is how if I were in a room and I was way up here and everybody else in the room, the top of their head was here, you would be like, yeah, Michael's a big guy. Michael's a tall guy. But then as soon as I go in this other room and it's full of basketball players and all of a sudden I'm down here and everybody else is way up there, all of a sudden I'm short. But wait a minute, what happened to my tallness? I thought I was a tall, big guy. I'm going to go back in the other room where I'm tall. I like it better over there, right? Now, what I'm getting at is, is that a characteristic or a quality it's something that you would think that I possess, that like I own it, that I have it. Like in the same way that you might think I'm old because I have a gray beard, you might think I'm an old, tall person. But in the same way that my tallness is, I'm not tall. I'm neither tall nor short. It depends and is dependent upon what I'm next to. And then even if I'm not in any room with any other people, and I asked you, am I a tall person? You might say, well, how tall are you? And I'll say six feet. And then you might go, yep, you're a tall person. But what you're doing, of course, is comparing me in your mind to your baseline understanding of height that might be five, 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 six. And by your baseline understanding of tall, I'm now a taller, per I'm the tall person or in that way. But what I'm getting at, of course, is that I am neither tall nor short. Of course, you know that, right? And I hope you understand how it is that I am neither tall nor short. So I am now free of that characteristic. Woo! I'm, so, I'm free of the characteristic of height. What would happen if we realized this about all the characteristics? That I'm not a male, Californian, tall, old dude. <laughs> that that's all these relative characteristics. Well, <laughs> the idea here is, is that sort of dwelling underneath all of these characteristics. And by the way, dwelling underneath all of those characteristics that you might have as well, but dwelling underneath all of those characteristics is the real body of the Buddha. And that's kind of this idea of Buddha nature, by the way, just to sneak this teaching in real quick. But it's that idea that if you understand the tricky dependent nature of characteristics and therefore understand that all characteristics are rather delusional, then you can see the Tathagata or the Buddha in that sense. All right, and that's gonna conclude my Dharma talk for tonight. Any last minute questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Yes, our friend Hot. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, a bodhisattva characteristic of, uh, of being generous, because uh, 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 they have nothing to attain. But can they be too giving, like Spider-Man 2, 2004 giving? 
where, where, where they're so the, 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 uh, they, 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 they sacrificed everything. Spider Man's more important than Peter Parker. There's not that balance. They're, they're too giving. Excellent. Excellent comment slash question. Really quickly, I will say this. And it, it, it was been, it's been here all night. A big part of especially the Bodhisattva path, but I would say it's all of Buddhism, by the way, they talk about it's equal measure wisdom and compassion. And what they say is, is actually that compassion without wisdom is potentially harmful and wisdom without compassion is useless. So yes, if there's no wisdom, you can kind of in a way go overboard in that sense. And that's where the Bodhisattva needs to be both kind of skilled in both wisdom and, and compassion in that way. And that's a practice that we know of as upaya or skillful means. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. We will continue our journey on the Bodhisattva path next week.